Welcome to Valley Politics History Interviews. I'm Terry Christensen. Norman Etta was mayor of San Jose from 1971 to 1974, the first Japanese American to be mayor of a major American city. He was elected to Congress in 1974 and went on to serve as Commerce Secretary for President Clinton and Transportation Secretary for President Bush. And he was on duty during the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Here for the first time is our 2015 interview with Mayor Mineta in full. So Norm Mineta, city councilman, mayor, member of Congress, committee chair, cabinet secretary to two presidents. We're interested in all that, but first tell us what you're doing now. Are you just playing golf and fishing? No, not at all. I, uh, I just don't want to retire, retire. <laughs> so, uh, I've left the Hill and Knowlton, so I'm doing some government relations work and do maybe two or three clients and no heavy lifting, but enough to keep the sheriff away from the front door. And you're back in San Jose pretty, I know you live in Washington. Right, I live where near the weather's Annapolis, so pleasant. Near, live, live near Annapolis, and, but come to San Jose at least uh, once a month. Of course, we're now at the Mineta Transportation Institute. Right. We know where that name came from and you still do work with the Institute. Very much. Right. Um, I want to talk about your childhood. You were 10 or 11 years old when you and other Japanese Americans, your family, were taken out of your community and taken to Wyoming for the internment camps. You were there for a couple of years. And I know you've got stories about that, but what I want to ask is how that experience of being interned as such a young, young child, almost teenager though, how that affected your political views later in life? Well, I think the uh, biggest thing was when those signs went up uh, about, about our evacuation and internment, and it said, attention, all those of Japanese ancestry, alien and non-alien. And even as a 10-year-old kid, as I looked at those posters, I thought, what's a non-alien? So, you know, it's a citizen, but here, my own government wasn't willing to acknowledge me as a citizen. Mm -hmm. I'm a non-alien. But when's the last time you stood up, beat your chest, and said, I'm a proud non-alien of right. the United States of America? And that's why I cherish the word citizen, because my own government wasn't willing to acknowledge me as a citizen. And to this day, I still cherish the word citizen, even though the, the greater impact was on adults. Uh, but even as a 10-year-old, that was the one thing that I just remember from the ex evacuation and internment experience. And how did that affect your, your politics later in your life in well, Congress? Well, when or? I became a member of the city council, uh, one of the things I said to myself was I was going to uh, represent those who had no representation or who were underrepresented. And I think I've stayed with that all, over all my years. Well, speaking of city council, you were the first minority person on the city council in over a hundred years. I don't know how much more than that. Uh, you got there by appointment by basically the white city council, right. all white male city council. No, Virginia Schaefer was on the council, wasn't she? Yes, she was. Yeah, all white, one woman. Uh, first minority in a century or more. Um, what gave you the the confidence and the ambition to accept that appointment and, and to work with that basically white power structure. Well, Ron James was a member of the city council. He got elected mayor yeah. and that created the vacancy. Mm -hmm. So Ron and Bob Miller, an incumbent member of the city council and Lou Soleri came to me and they said, look, we're gonna fill that appointment by, vac uh, by uh, appointment. So would you consider sending us, sending us your application so we could interview you. And so I said, well, let me, uh, let me talk to my dad because I'm in insurance business with him. So when I talked to him, he said, well, you know, you and I can make whatever arrangements to run the business. Mm -hmm. But in Japan, and he was an immigrant from Japan, in Japan there's an old adage that if you're in politics, you're like that nail sticking out of the board. Uh -huh. And he said, you know what <laughs> happens to that nail? It always gets hammered. Now, can you stand being hammered by your friends, your neighbors, constituents. And I said, well, Papa, it's only for a two-year unexpired term. So 
if I don't like it, then I'll just drop it. If I like it, then I can r run for election. So um, as a result of that interview process, I was appointed to the city council. Now in 71, when Mayor Ron James decided not to seek re-election, I ran, was elected, and I created again a vacancy. Mm -hmm. So I said to the Mexican-American community, I think a Mexican-American should be on the council. Population was about 12% of the city. And so I said, give me some names. So the community responded and gave me a n number of names. And we picked from that group. The second minority person That's right. to be on the city council Absolutely. in many years. Yeah, you ran for re, uh, re election, election of, of council, re -election. Of council yeah. in 1969, Nine. and then for mayor in 71. Right. So I guess you didn't get hammered too hard in those first two years? No, you know, the city of San Jose is such a collaborative kind of a city. Well, some would say and it used to be, <laughs> but definitely it was. Right. Yeah. Well, the Congress used to be also. <laughs> So, 1971, you were elected mayor, a stunning election because you had how many, 14 appointments, or there were 14, 14. of you running? Unemployment was that bad. <laughs> and you won, and you needed a majority of 50% plus one. That's almost impossible to imagine uh, these days that anybody could achieve that. So you really had a broad base of support. Uh, you served as mayor until 1974 when you ran for Congress. During your term as mayor, what do you think was your proudest accomplishment? Well, we were going from an agricultural to a high-tech community. And so I was doing a lot of economic development work to try to bring high-tech companies mm -hmm. in. And I remember we um, attracted a company. We had a press conference, and I said at the end, so if you want to know more about it, write to me at mayor at uh, California, period, uh, San Jose, period, gov. My press secretary is John Spaulding, yeah. chief of staff. I remember John tugging at my sleeve <laughs> saying, dot, dot, not period. Because we were so brand new with the nomenclature. Yeah. No one, uh, at least I didn't know. So here I'm saying, so write to me at mayor at California, period, San Jose, period, gov. That was very early days for all oh, that. Oh, absolutely. Very early. Yeah. So your proudest accomplishment was bringing in some high-tech high -tech business. That, make, and making that transition from an agricultural, agricultural community yeah to prepare it for the eventuality. When people were, were asking me, why are you putting so much money into the sewage treatment plant? Well, I knew we were gonna be at least a million, and we had to get ready for that. And the nature of agriculture and high tech mix, so to speak, for the sewage treatment plant, different. Yeah. So we had to do a lot of planning for the transition of the community. Was the IBM plant at Santa Teresa, was that on no, your watch? No, that's one of the things I uh, brought in. Yeah. And I remember when uh, the attorney, Marshall, he called and he said, look, you're going to be talking to someone who's very prominent in business. <laughs> he can't identify. But we're in competition with several other communities to bring in this high-tech laboratory. And so I never knew uh, who we were dealing with but I knew it was a serious proposition. But that Santa Teresa area has all been redeveloped now with Hitachi and massive residential and commercial, right. so big changes. Absolutely. But that IBM plant was a crucial. It was a, and you know, well, I had three areas, urban, urban transition, urban reserve. It was in the urban reserve area. I remember we it was controversial. Going, yeah. We weren't supposed to be doing any yeah. development, but if you do a cost benefit study mm -hmm. and it comes in favor of the city's figures, then you could allow it. But people were saying, oh, you guys are, are uh, crunching the numbers. Uh, and, uh, but it was really a legitimate study. What about big disappointment from your time as mayor? Was there something you didn't achieve that you had really hoped to? You know, here I come into office on the 1st of July, and in September, uh, we had a shooting of a young IBM engineer making an improper John Henry U -turn, Smith. Improper U-turn in a residential mm -hmm. district. Now that happened at one in the afternoon. By five, I must have had 2,000 people mm -hmm. at City Hall. I was there. And uh, that was something that I uh, really had to work on. And uh, it's something that I had to deal with in the f 
three and a half year term. Mm -hmm. I was uh, mayor, uh, just in terms of how to deal with the police department. One of the things we did was to institute psychological testing mm -hmm. of the police officers. And I mean, the POA just came down yeah. and said, what do you think, we're a bunch of uh, psychotics? Or I said, no, 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 this is for your protection as well. And now there isn't a city in the country that doesn't do psychological testing. And when that happened, I called Lee Brown, who had been a member of our San Jose Police Department. He, he's the one who really guided me through that whole thing. And then also introduced to me the concept of COPS, community-oriented police services. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've always just loved Lee Brown for all he did. It seems to me one of the turning points in San Jose politics when you were in office was 1973 when Ted Tedesco was hired as city manager and there seemed to be a real break between the old guard, San Jose, and the new guard represented by you, Janet Gray Hayes, and some other people on the city council. Tell us about that process, hiring the new city manager. Well, the whole issue of development overpowered everything. If you had a square foot of land somewhere, build on it. And I remember Joe Ritter once told me, trees don't read newspapers. Mm -hmm. Joe Ritter, the publisher of the Mercury of the News. Of the San Jose Mercury right. News. And uh, so um, then on top of that, when we were pressing for for uh, the BART into Santa Clara County, and he said, well, all those people will leave San Jose to go to San Francisco. And I'd say, well, yeah, but the train runs both <laughs> ways. So there was this change, and uh, we brought in Tedesco from... Boulder, Colorado, he was one of these who said there have to be metrics for doing things. And he was just terrific, not only as a personality, as a driver, but in terms of his conduct of how business gets done. The story I heard is that Joe Ritter, the publisher of the Mercury News, called you out to the Mercury News. You, the mayor, oh, absolutely. to tell you not to hire yeah. Ted Tedesco. Right. So that's a true story. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Because I've been writing about no. it for a while. So you ran for Congress in 1974. And you know, Jim Ono, a friend of mine, called me uh, in the third week of January 1974 at quarter to six in the morning on a Sunday. <laughs> so I pick up the phone. Hello. Hey, Norm, did you see the paper? I said, what are you talking about seeing the paper? It's quarter to six in the morning. No, I didn't see the paper. Charlie Goopser's uh, not going to seek re-election. Well, that's nice. No, 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 you've got to run. I said, Jim, I've already said in September of 73 I was going to seek re-election. October 74, Tom Bradley came up from LA, the mayor, and we did a big fundraiser. So my path is running for re-election. So I said, I think you ought to go back to sleep. I am. And I hung <laughs> up on him. Seven o'clock that night, the doorbell rang. And I go to answer the door, and this fellow's standing there. And I said, Gene, what are you doing here? He says, I don't know. Jim Ono told me to be here at <laughs> seven o'clock. He had, had invited 20 people to the house at seven that night. I didn't know about it. <laughs> and the whole question was, can a Democrat be elected yeah. in that seat? So, you know, we had to look at the Wilson Riles, um, African American public superintendent of schools, mm -hmm. and how did he do in these precincts? Yeah. And uh, the Rumsford uh, fair housing law. There were a number of indicators we wanted to see how this looked. And in those days, no one had computers. We had to go down precinct 1478, take down the numbers, and then bring it back and then I we'd remember. have to yeah. crunch the numbers and yeah there's a possibility so in uh, the early part of march just before the deadline for filing i then declared i was going to run for congress returned all the money i had raised for mayor and suggested they could still be <laughs> donating for the congressional campaign and that started and it was really a it was, it was still shaky yeah 
until August of 74 and the well, people now the don't whole, remember this was a Republican whole, area until, the until that whole issue turning point. Watergate, Watergate. And, uh, President Nixon resigning, and all of a sudden you could see the polls starting to change. And then you served happily in Congress for 20 I did. years? You know, I, when we got elected in that November, there were 75 Democratic new members. Mm -hmm. I was honored to chair that new members caucus, and it was just uh, people who had been elected and never served in public office, now in a member of Congress. And uh, there were other members of the Congress who knew the kind of rules, rules changes that had to occur. And we were an army of 75 votes yeah. within the Democratic caucus. So we had a great deal of sway and it was just an exciting time. What do you think your greatest accomplishment was? as a member of Congress? Well, I would have to say there are two. One was the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, ISTEA, which became known as ICE-T. And that was the first rewrite of the National Defense Highway Act that President Eisenhower yeah. signed in 1956. So I rewrote the whole highway law and introduced a new concept. The first word was intermodal, and it o had always been a highway bill, mm -hmm. but we got intermodal in there to include transit. And the other part of that bill was to establish um, as a process uh, metropolitan planning organizations like the MTC, the Metropolitan yeah. Transportation Commission here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And so that's now a pattern across the country. The second bill was H.R. 442, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, where Congress apologized to the Japanese American population for the what was termed as the gross uh, unconstitutional act of the evacuation internment. So Those are big accomplishments. Why did you step down from Congress in 1990? You got reelected in 94, no problem, but you resigned in 95. Well, that was the um, Gingrich Revolution. The Republicans took over. Mm -hmm. So um, the, uh, it just changed totally. When I called our new chairman, who had been my ranking uh, Republican, I said, you were we, the chair of the Transportation I, I was and the Public chair, Works Committee. And now I was, I was the ranking right. Democrat on the committee. So I said, Bud, wh when are we going to get together to talk about the agenda? Oh, Norm, I should have talked to you about this before. But the speaker says, we're now in the majority, and we don't have to consult with you at all. And I said, Bud, the committee way of doing business was always a bipartisan rule of four. Chairman of the full committee, ranking Republican on the full committee, chairman of the subcommittee, ranking on the subcommittee. And the four would decide everything. He said, no, we're, we're deciding everything on our own. So February, March, April, I'm twiddling my thumb and uh, not getting anything done. And in June, Lockheed Martin came to me and said, you know, we've been toying with this little transportation company we think we can make a go of it. We'd like to have you mm. consider running the company. And I said, well, I can't. I don't want to leave. I just left uh, one in November. If I leave in midterm, I'll, it, it, I would get pilloried. And, uh, and I can't negotiate with you while I'm still in Congress. So in August, I called him and I said, hey, did you guys find a, someone to run that company? No. I said, well, come back and talk to me some more about it. So they did, and then in September I announced that I'm stepping down October 15th or October 12th. So I stepped down in October, then negotiated with Lockheed Martin and went to work for them. And then just a few years later, you became Secretary of Commerce for President Clinton. Yes. And not too much after that, Secretary of Transportation for President Bush. That's almost unheard of, that somebody's worked for two presidents, especially two presidents of different parties. What was that like? What was what Well, because the, the nature of the two are so vastly different. 
The thing about President Bush is that he treated his job like a CEO. And when I talked to him, he said, you know, I want to hire you because you, you're a subject matter expert. And because I was wanting to talk to him about budget, personnel, and policy. And he said, on budget, you're going to have to arm wrestle with everybody else at OMB. But you're a subject matter expert. So I'm going to lean into you for policy personnel. But I don't want you hiring all Democrats <laughs> at the Department of Transportation. And I said, no, no, I'll use the Presidential Personnel Office as our uh, way of hiring people. And uh, so I really enjoyed working under President Bush, as I did with President Clinton. But President Bush sort of said, this is your department to run. And uh, so, you know, 9-11 occurs right after that. And then uh, we had Katrina, we had uh, Hurricane Rita and Isabel. So we had just a whole bunch of things. And, uh, but I had a great team at the department and we were able to respond to all of those. You mentioned 9-11. Um, you were in the bunker at the White House with President, Vice President Dick Cheney, right? Are you the one that said, bring, bring the, plane? the plane? Bring the planes down. Bring the planes down. When that f plane hit at the Pentagon, I was talking to Monty Belger, the number two at Federal Aviation Administration. I said, Monty, we've had three commercial airplanes used as missiles today. And when one of that, anything happens, it's an accident two of the same things happen, it's a trend. But when three of the same thing happen in a relatively short period of time, it's a plan or action. And we don't know what's going on. And in the military, they have something called a stand down. And we're gonna have to do our own stand mm -hmm. down. And to me, that means bringing all the planes down. So Monty had been a professional air traffic controller from the time he started and now he's number two in the department. So he said, we'll bring down the planes per pilot discretion. And I said, screw pilot discretion. I want all the planes down. Because I didn't want a pilot in Albuquerque yeah. thinking, well, I'm going to just fly on to LA. I want all the planes down. So in two hours and 20 minutes, and we had 4,638 planes in the air, all down safely and without Incident. It must have been terrifying just not knowing what was happening. And having, oh, absolutely. Having so much responsibility. Oh, absolutely. Because here we had three major targets. And, uh, you know, you can't go to a shelf and pick up, pull out the book and say, let's see now, what am I supposed to do right. on a situation like yeah. this? So you're just doing everything off the seat of your pants. It's an amazing experience. Absolutely. I want to bring you back to local politics now. So what would your advice be to young people thinking about getting into politics? Well, I, I still encourage people to do that. But, you know, uh, public service can be anywhere from being a well-read citizen to running for office. Yeah. And the running for office maybe is, I don't know, one or two percent of the population. So I always say, look, mayors, county officials, governors, even the president are always looking for good people. So I want you to pursue your professional goal, but save some time to say to the mayor, I'd like to serve on a board or a commission. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I think of Jim Bell, who I appointed as a youth commissioner. Yeah, now our state senator. City Council, Assembly, now a state senator chair of the transportation yes. committee for the say, state senate. So people c can be in public service, not run for office, but still volunteer their time or um, become an appointee of the uh, administration and still be in public service. That's great advice. Thank you very much, Norm Mineta. Well, thank you, Terry, for all that you've done. <laughs> For other interviews with the leaders and activists who shape the history of San Jose and Santa Clara County, look for the Valley Politics History interviews on YouTube.